everyone. Uh, my name is Liz. I'm the philanthropy officer at Phonalytics. Uh, thank you so much for joining what is going to be now our first session. Uh, just as a reminder, all the sessions will be recorded. So if you wanted to talk to Varda, please do go to that breakout room. Uh, you'll be able to catch all the sessions afterwards. So if you want that one-on-one -on -one connecting time, that's what this is about. Uh, our first session of the day is regional advocacy for farmed animals. Uh, and I'm excited to present the first speaker of the session, Jack Stennan, who is a researcher at Good Growth, who will discuss stakeholder engagement research. Hello, my name is Jack Stenner at Good Growth, and this is a presentation on harnessing the power of stakeholder engaged research in animal advocacy. So firstly, a quick overview. We're gonna first introduce the challenges that are currently facing um, animal advocacy research in Asia, propose stakeholder engaged research as a solution, share a framework for analyzing and designing SER and give a few examples of how SER is currently used in Chinese animal advocacy. Finally, we'll offer a set of recommendations on how to approach SER and integrate it into your research. But first, who are we? So at Good Growth, we aim to accelerate the growth of ethical food systems in Asia by supporting animal advocacy and alternative protein organizations with research and design. Our work focuses on three core areas, alternative protein with a focus on customer and market research, exploring farmed animal welfare in underexplored Asian contexts, and supporting the ecosystem of animal advocates through our research. In the last few years working in this space, we've identified a few different challenges in animal advocacy research in Asia. Firstly, we found there's not enough diversity in methodology and too much reliance, in particular on surveys. This means that findings often lack depth and context, which may lead to an inability to find the most impactful and context-relevant research ideas and interventions. Second, local stakeholders are often underrepresented. Um, one of our studies of advocates in China showed that some advocates felt that international organizations and funders dominated decision-making. We've also noticed that external organizations and research groups Research groups frequently conduct a lot of their research without substantial local involvement. This means that local organizations feel a lack of ownership and are less able to pursue the most suitable strategies for their local context. There are also some pot potential risks. For example, without local involvement, there can be a higher risk of a public backlash against certain advocacy groups or campaigns. And because of these issues with methods and representation, research topics and findings might not be the most relevant to the work of local advocates. Um, so this means there's lower usage and incentive to use research. Um, there may also be issues with buy-in and trust in research findings as advocates and local stakeholders were not involved in the research process. And we've also found that research lacks relevance for local advocates who are in a position to act upon the research. To address, address these issues, we believe that more engagement with stakeholders throughout the research process is necessary, which we're gonna call um, stakeholder engaged research or SER. And SER addresses the issues I've just mentioned in three ways. Instead of relying on surveys, SER introduces a range of different research methods with varying levels of engagement with stakeholders, which usually provides a greater understanding of context, more holistic recommendations, and a greater robustness of findings when used in combination with various methods. SER also addresses issues of representation by including different stakeholders in the research process. Stakeholder participation and input can also create buy-in and a sense of ownership, which can lead to more trust in and greater adoption of research findings. Altogether, engagement can enable the production of research that more, that's more relevant to stakeholders' local context and decision-making, leading to more adoption and impact. Okay, so how do we approach and classify SER? So you've probably heard of some different SER methodologies, such as community-based or participatory research, which are popular in different fields. And to, but to distinguish them, we've recently conducted a multidisciplinary review of engaged research practices across fields and developed a framework that looks at SER across two different dimensions, configurations or methods and objectives. In terms of methods, we've identified six different levels of engagement or configurations from communicating to co-research. So the most basic form of engagement is just communicating your findings to other stakeholders before and during research, while on the other end of the spectrum, the most engaged form of research is when stakeholders co-research with, um, with the academics or practitioners, playing an equal role in the research, not just participating in the process, but also approaching the research with their own goals in mind. Um, in terms of objective, we divide this into process and product. So we've noticed that research objectives differ based on whether the focus is on using stakeholder engagement to produce better research or better outcomes, which is a product, or whether the process itself is the objective. Um, so the re research is done in order to better represent stakeholders or in increase capacity building or empowerment um, as ex explicit objectives. So we have these dimensions of SER. 
but we wanted to see how actual animal advocacy research, particularly in Asia, looks when we put it onto these axes. So we illustrate it here with more or less engaged forms of research on the x-axis and more process or product focused research on the y-axis. So we looked at the Faunalytics database for farmed animal welfare studies um, based in China. And we've analyzed 25 academic and grey literature articles according to their stating methods and objectives. And as you can see here, we found that most responses cluster around the bottom left corner, meaning that most of the articles we looked at use less engaged, more product focused research methods. This is in particular surveys that consult stakeholders, for example, consumers, but neglected any deeper forms of engagement. However, there were a handful of articles that use methods with alternative um, engagement objectives or methodologies. To illustrate more clearly what this kind of research looks like, we can frame it in terms of four different quadrants. So we have understanding on the bottom left, which is increasing the understanding of stakeholders, or sometimes their understanding of the research that's being conducted. In the top left, we have involving, which focuses on inclusion and representation. Um, on the bottom right, innovating, which is working with stakeholders to produce novel insights, product or programs. And finally, on the top right, um, empowering, which is used for research used for building the capacity of stakeholders. Okay, to give a few examples of what this research looks like, um, let's look at a few case studies um, in this data set based on China. So an example of an understanding study is one of our own research projects on farmed animal protection in China. We used focus group discussions to understand Chinese consumers' attitudes towards animal welfare, meat consumption, and their interest in higher welfare products. The objective of this study was product leaning um, because producing research insights for advocates was our main goal. And the configuration was consult because we consulted with advocates and consumers before and during the study, but did not continue to engage with these stakeholders later in the research process. Um, an example of an involving study is this academic-led article which investigated the attitudes of stakeholders towards improving the welfare of animals during slaughter and transport in four Asian countries. The objective of this study was process leaning because it was used to inform workshops that form part of a larger project with the explicit aim of improving stakeholder knowledge around animal welfare standards. Um, sorry, but the configuration was consulted because the study used a stakeholder survey to inform these workshops. An example of innovating research in our data set was a think tank report into the cycle of inertia around dietary transition, which was conducted with multiple stakeholders across different countries, including China. The objective was product leaning because it was focused on developing research insights. However, the configuration was co-create because multiple stakeholders from government, industry, and the public contributed throughout the research process through various consultations, roundtable discussions, and focus groups which informed the research. Note that empowering is missing from our data set, but community-based particip participatory research in healthcare is a com common example of process-leaning co-created research. It generally has the explicit objectives of empowering community members to take ownership of local healthcare needs. However, we haven't found any good examples of this in the data set we looked at, looking at animal advocacy in Asia. Okay, so now that you've seen how different studies have employed SER, we wanted to leave you with a few key considerations and questions to ask when thinking about using SER in your upcoming research projects. So first and foremost, you need to ask what are the objectives and desired outcomes of your research projects? So are you looking to develop a product like a new online platform to support vegans or a process like supporting local animal advocacy groups function more effectively? These objectives might be linked or even support each other. So you might develop a more effective product or platform if the people who are going to use this product feel a sense of ownership from their role in developing it. So step one, identify objectives and outcomes. Next, um, who are the stakeholders that should be engaged? So if the goal for this research um, is to create impact for animals, you need to consider which stakeholders need to be brought into the research in order to achieve that outcome. For example, a research project focusing on improved um, welfare methods in farms requires buy-in from the agricultural workers themselves and potentially other supply chain or government actors. Okay, and finally, how to engage. This is likely to depend a lot on your context and we have some trade-offs here. So different configurations that we discussed earlier or levels of engagement require very different investment of time and resources. So it's not necessarily the case that the more engagement, the better. One approach that we've seen is different configurations being used during different phases of a multi-part project. 
So it's common there will be less engagement in a quantitative or data analysis phase, for example. A simple way of integrating SER might look like beginning your project with stakeholder interviews, for example, while more ambitious configurations might look like sharing ownership of a research project with non-academic stakeholders. Okay. So thanks for listening. If you're interested in putting SER into action or conducting research in this field, please get in touch with us at hello at gogrowth.io. We're happy to help out and we're keen on exploring how different levels of stakeholder engagement in research can result in diverse research and effective advocacy outcomes. Thank you. Thank you for the wonderful presentation, Jack. Uh, so we have Jiayin Chung, co-founder of Good Growth and author of the study that will be taking questions. Uh, we have some questions about resources to be shared so that will uh, of course be shared via email afterwards. Uh, but we have another one here asking what opportunities for collaboration between advocates working in animal advocacy and other sectors such as environment and climate when engaging stakeholders? Um, I'm not sure I can directly answer that question now, um, but there might be some upcoming research that we'll, we might be working with Wallogics on that could help answer that question. Um, I, yeah, I think if it's specifically about what opportunities there are, um, that might have to be an answer further down the line. Uh, but I think we could also look at like certain organizations already working on this. So obviously Samayu is doing that um, by working with uh, kind of like movements or or uh, stakeholders that are interested in some things that overlap with animals, but that might not be their main objective. There are other organizations like Forum for the Future, um, also like organizations like Asia Research and Engagement. They also do different projects that um, from their perspective might be looking at animals, but uh, look at a broader topic that can encompass interests from many different groups. Um, so I might point you to those organizations to look at the work that they do. Wonderful. Uh, so in interest of moving forward with additional presentations, uh, if you want to continue the discussion, uh, please wait until the end of the session where you can go into a breakout room with all the speakers uh, from this session. So next up, we have Altamush Saeed, uh, a Pakistani animal rights lawyer, philanthropist, and teacher who will discuss, discuss Islamic faith and animals. Good evening. My name is Altamush Saeed, and I'm very honored to present at the Fauna Connections Using Data to Help Animals Fauna Analytics Symposium 2023 on the very important topic of how followers of the Islamic faith see animals. Uh, as always, I always begin my presentation with acknowledgement that which I firmly believe in, that we, the members of the human race, acknowledge the harm and cruelty that we have imposed upon animals who are equal citizens of planet Earth but have yet no say. Uh, the why behind this presentation uh, is actually, which is, which is very important, is that 2.01 billion of the global 8 billion population is actually just people of the Islamic faith. Therefore, a farm animal movement is hard to imagine without involving Muslims in the conversation. Now, on the other hand, Islam as a religion strongly advocates for animal welfare, it advocates for animal stewardship, it advocates for veganism, and it also advocates against factory farming, which is very important for developing a farm animal movement. However, these values are something that the Western farm animal movement does not know about, and Therefore, this is very important. So to help fellow animal advocates, I've divided this presentation into four parts. Uh, the first part is actually sources from the Quran and Sunnah, which are the primary sources of the Islamic religion. Uh, I've gathered all possible sources which you can use to make a case for animal stewardship, veganism, and against factory farming. The second part is data review, which will be the major part of this presentation. Then we follow by recommendations, and um, as I run this charity, uh, as I run a charity myself called Charity Doings Foundation, a nonprofit registered in Pakistan and the U.S., we actually work for, for farm animals and animals, particularly in Pakistan. So I've actually implemented a lot of these recommendations in reality, and I wanted to share them with fellow fellow animal advocates. So to begin with, these are some of the sources that are from the Quran and Sunnah, which you can use. I will not be explaining them right now. Uh, 
but uh, I will, I'm writing a paper on this and I'm also available by email to actually answer all of these queries and especially help the Western farm animal movement uh, on advocating for animal welfare in Islam and reaching out people of the Islamic faith to strengthen this movement. Uh, there are a lot of sources in the religion that advocate for animal stewardship as shared here and uh, there are a lot which you be uh, which we can use to actually make a respectful conversation with Muslims uh, there is a lot of sources of in the Quran and Sunnah also on veganism and lastly there are sources available against factory farming as well because Islam as is a religion advocates for strong animal stewardship and at the same time it puts a ban on animal cruelty it puts a ban on an severe animal husbandry practices that are a common part of factory farms so these are very important for us to know and so we can converse with people of the Islamic faith and help them become stronger animal advocates uh, so before I go into the data review I want to talk about where I got my data so as I told you that I uh, run a nonprofit in Pakistan uh, which is called Charity Link Foundations last year we actually had a flood uh, which drowned one-third of my country, killed over 1,700 human beings and over a million livestock animals. We went into the flood zones uh, and actually provided emergency veterinary aid for animals and also provided over 120,000 kilograms of food and were able to rescue 8,000 farm animals. So we conversed with those people and were able to basically gather observational data on how they see animals and they are shared further in this presentation before before i go go forward i just wanted to share a few things that are really important uh, for us to understand uh, pakistan actually has an islamic legal system where i'm from and anything that goes against us, such principles is unconstitutional therefore factory farming is unconstitutional and the the impact of this actually observation is that there are many other islamic countries as well uh, where this this is possible and as animal rights advocates and I'm an animal rights lawyer this can actually be used in further strengthening the factory farm movement but uh, before we go forward we need to understand how the religion is how it advocates for animal welfare and we need to actually try a very respectful line because uh, we need to be able to you know advocate uh, from the heart of, of what Islam is and that's really important and that's something the Western movement lacks at the same time, Pakistan actually is a victim of abject poverty and there's a lot of lack of educational resources and culture, culturally, uh, there are different cultures across the country and they actually have a huge impact on how religion is seen and how those people see animals. And since our data comes from Sindh where we went to the flood zones to rescue farm animals, uh, this province particularly has a, a very derailed growth rate and a very low human development index. And that has actually uh, impacted on how people actually see animals and that's really important uh, as I mentioned before Pakistan has an Islamic legal system so anything that goes against the religion is unconstitutional and that is true for other Islamic countries as well so this kind of advocacy is really important and we need to actually further develop it and these are a few pictures from where uh, we actually did the farm animal rescue last uh, last year in the flood zone uh, more pictures so we actually work with these people. Some of and people in, in, in these pictures are some of them are our vets. We are giving them food and talking with the community. Uh, there are some limitations that I wanted to talk about first. Since this was a flood zone, most of our work actually involved uh, around human and animal rescue. So only we had uh, observational data to rely on. At the same time, there is no animal rights movement in Pakistan. So doing a survey was actually really hard we couldn't put direct questions on how they see animals the default on the other hand uh, in Pakistan on the same hand is anthropocentrism and culture actually has a significant impact on how Muslims see animals and the scattered 2 billion population across the world therefore will have different cultures and therefore would have different viewpoints so every segment of the Islamic population across the world has to be separately acknowledged and then understood and then uh, they need to be involved in creating a farm animal movement. Uh, some of the cultural observations that we had from our data was because of poverty, actually people, mostly Muslims in Sindh have a plant-based diet because they can't afford it. And they see farm animal meat actually as a luxury, This, which basically adds into the annual Islamic slaughter religious event that happens once a year. 
Secondly, as most of the schools were destroyed, the region's access to education is very limited. And therefore, I personally believe that a climate change advocacy for farm animals isn't possible without an educational overhaul. Uh, I mean, the climate change part is coming from the floods and the educational part is very important to educate these people firstly about the Islamic values of animal welfare and to actually provide them a, a platform where they can succeed in, in life. Uh, the religious observations were that the animal slaughter is actually mandatory, especially in the animal religious slaughter event, which actually, you know, helps understand that there's an educational gap. At the same time, uh, since food and farm animal food is a luxury for these people in Sindh, this adds to the, uh, the, to the slaughter event itself. And sharing of farm animals is actually preferred over plant-based meat. And many actually people of the Islamic faith in this uh, in Sindh do not know about factory farming or where their food comes from. And also Islam actually has a concept of superiority of her man over others, which is kind of anthropocentrism. However, in the religion, there's the concept of vice regency as well, vice guarantee, where actually Muslims have a duty towards animals. And that is something that these people actually didn't know about. And uh, from a religious perspective, it is believed that we should always rescue human first. I mean, again, another anthropocentric thought. So it's actually better if you're advocating in countries that do not have an animal welfare movement. We work on both human rescue and animal rescue. So we put human and animals at the same level. Uh, so lastly, my recommendations actually are that since Pakistan, particularly where this data is coming from, doesn't have an animal rights movement and culture actually drives uh, anthropocentrism, to cut away at the heart of anthropocentrism, we actually should create grassroots movements where both humans and animals are supported and we're putting them at the same level. And since uh, many of the people here eat plant-based food, shifting ideologies towards animal welfare like you know for the right reason ethical veganism would be really hard and since many of the schools have been destroyed it would actually be easier to actually create vegan schools and then advocate for animal welfare through islam at these schools and lastly which is very important is that pakistan actually has blasphemy laws in the book where anything that's said against the, the religion can be prosecuted so it's actually better if people from the west do not speak about this because they don't know about this and at the same time, it actually becomes hard for people of the Islamic faith to speak about these things as well. And in the end, I just want to share these pictures where we are sharing these recommendations in reality, where we work to rescue both humans and animals in the flood zone. This is a picture from the flood zone from last year. We helped with the humans. This is a vegan school, 100%. We feed them vegan food. And we are actually creating a course where we'll be teaching them about animal welfare. These are some of the pictures at school and and humans and we also actually create water projects that help both humans and animals at the same time cutting away at anthropocentrism because uh, that's how we can you know create spaces where we can advocate for both human and animal welfare and especially in countries that do not have an animal welfare movement so these are the most pictures and uh, thank you so much for this person uh, for giving the opportunity to speak about this very important topic and I'm open to questions thank you Thank you for the wonderful presentation. I don't know if you saw me. I was like, ooh, the whole time. Uh, so one of the questions we have is, how about countries like Indonesia, Malaysia? Are you seeing the potential that linkages between Islam and veganism can be made in, by involving more clerics and ummas? I hope I pronounced that right. I apologize if I mispronounced. And how can we effectively do it? So uh, firstly, thank you so much again. Um, I love the question, but... Uh, you know, when we think about different data points from different countries, even though Indonesia and Malaysia is, uh, they have a very big population of Muslims, that's a starting point. But the thing is, uh, the way those countries' culture engages with the Islam uh, uh, directly and how it engages with animals is going to make actually the biggest amount of difference. And at this point, uh, I'm still conducting some data research on Indonesia particularly, uh, they are not open to uh, talking about Islamic animal welfare for somebody who is not a follower of that faith. So that's the starting point. But uh, there is definitely potential. So the, the question actually answers itself uh, about the clerics and the ummah's part. So these are basically faith-based religious leaders. Uh, but unfortunately, and I'm still researching, and this is not even true for Pakistan, we don't actually have uh, faith-based leaders who advocate for veganism. And without those leaders, without those voices, it's actually really hard to, you know, make this, this case because in, in many countries like Pakistan, 
uh, I haven't read the legal system in Indonesia and Malaysia, but there is a strong tension, you know, when we make these arguments and you don't know about the proper resources or you don't have the access to the public or the public doesn't see you as like an expert in Islam, particularly making those cases makes the movement even harder. So that sets a, a kind of a very difficult precedent for other uh, Muslim-based veganism movements to come in and, you know, make a stronger case. So I would say start from there, but there's definitely room and we need to engage in more conversations with clerics and umas everywhere, wherever we can find them. But uh, it's going to be a very hard conversation with them. That's what I would say. Amazing. Thank you so much. I have uh, two more. They're not really questions, but rather comments. So maybe just uh, for these ones, uh, somebody would love to have a list of the exam Islamic sources and quotations mentioned. So maybe uh, we can do that connection in the breakout room. Um, and then right. another comment that uh, someone's surprised that there are no animal movements in the entire country, not even grassroots activists. So maybe if there's any information oh, oh. about that. I, I will correct that. So by a movement, I meant something on a global scale in Pakistan. We don't have that, but we do have grassroots activists. I mean, there's Animal Advocacy Asia working currently. They do these uh, animal justice academies every year. There are some local, very local uh, shelters, which actually cater to companion animals at this moment. So the movement actually in Pakistan is super young. And as all animal welfare movements have started across the world, it's from companion animals. So we are there at this point. And even then, uh, we are working currently on a nation level on dog culling or basically uh, population control for dogs at this moment. Because from a religious perspective, actually, dogs are not seen as something really nice. I don't want to put bad words, but I think that's untrue because, again, from a religious perspective, there's a gap between people understanding where dogs are situated in the religion because the religion itself calls for animal welfare for all animals. So there's a tension there and there's a gap of education on both sides. So at this point, Pakistan is completely companion animal based movement. It's growing. So there's nothing about farm animals here. So I would just correct that. So there are local groups, but nothing like a movement level. Wonderful. And we have a little bit more time. I see uh, that Kathleen has raised her hand. So if she would like to unmute, uh, I'll let her ask her question. Uh, but we'll have to keep it short. We have only uh, three minutes. Okay. Uh, thank you. Assalamu alaikum, brother. Uh, thanks for the great presentation. I took Shahada in January of 14. Now, um, I understand the Quran is not malleable and it's not changeable, but scholars are still discovering uh, things in it every day since it's like a, uh, an onion with many layers and they're still peeling the layers away. Do you see a possibility that at some point a, a hidden, tr a, a thus far hidden truth will be found in the Quran that we, uh, that we're supposed to adopt plant-based diets and not eat animals. Do you see that uh, as a possible academic and intellectual development in Islam's future? Thank you. Uh, firstly, thank you so much for that question, Kathleen. Uh, we can get there, but we cannot directly go there because uh, at this point, we don't have faith-based leaders who have advocated for veganism or vegetarianism even. So people need those people to look up to. And we can start with, for example, banning factory farming because there's direct quotations from the Quran that says animal cruelty and animal husbandry is bad. So we can shut them down first and then uh, start a, growing the movement. So it can happen one day, but it has to start uh, with more scholarship, I would say. It's already in there. There's no nothing hidden. The animal welfare part, it's right there. People are just not picking it up. Wonderful. Well, that looks like that's all the time we have. I think that we probably could continue with questions and answers for another 15 minutes. Uh, so if you want to continue the discussion, please do uh, join the breakout room at the end uh, with speakers from all the sessions. Next up, uh, we have Lucas Asinas, uh, the co-founder of Healthier Hens, who will present on the current state of cage-free hen welfare in Kenya. Okay. Thanks so much for tuning in. My name is Lucas and I'm one of the co-founders of Healthier Hens, a farmed animal welfare organization aiming at improving the conditions for the hens worldwide. So today I'm going to share a bit about the insights that we've uh, been gathering into the welfare of cage-free hens kept in Kenya, um, mainly through farmer awareness and welfare issues that we're um, observing. 
So to give you a, a quick overview, our goal is, of course, to better understand the current state of the well-being and welfare of hens kept, kept cage-free in the region. Um, and to do that, we've uh, conducted feed quality testing, uh, farmer welfare awareness, and on-farm welfare assessments. And all of this is, of course, done to contribute to the development of evidence-based interventions and setting up guidelines for improving and actually uh, changing the conditions for the hens. So first of all, uh, you might not have uh, been thinking about feed as a form of welfare as of now, but um, we believe that um, it is an important part of the conversation to be had, especially because um, issues such as, uh, for example, keel bone fractures are quite prevalent, at least in the global north, um, even on cage-free farms, so um, feed, of course, is a big part of how um, hens develop physiologically. So it is an important um, input, and of course, is uh, one of the biggest cost drivers for the farm. So it's um it's a leverage uh, that could be used. So to in to look into the quality of the feed in the country, we've analyzed um, commercial feed samples, um, essentially to check whether there is this risk and um, whether the enforcement is in place in regards of, uh, of the standards that are currently in place. And we use also um, targeted sampling. So um, through external laboratories, we've analyzed 30 samples of commercial feeds from several locations and uh, time points. And regarding some of the results, um, there is a risk, in fact, that um, the quality might be questionable. Um, so, for example, across the four key nutrients, calcium, phosphorus, vitamin D3, and protein, um, at least one of them was deficient in uh, a third of the feeds, but uh, quite often it was actually several uh, nutrients that were below optimal. And of course, there's also the conversation about whether the current standard uh, corresponds with the actual optimal uh, nutrient levels, and we believe that the, the standard could be updated and improved. There is also a risk of um, inconsistency. So we tested uh, samples of the same producer across time, and we did see that um, the quality can uh, vary and drop off at certain points. Um, especially so, it was the case um, with protein content. So um, the region was facing shortages of protein-rich ingredients, and it's it's clearly visible that um, the 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 levels of protein in the feed dropped off below um, below even the standard levels um, in, in across a, um, a a point of time during our testing. And um, unfortunately, this was not even communicated publicly. The feed prices did not reflect this, so there was obviously a big um, uproar. Uh, within the farmer community regarding this, not to mention, of course, the the risks that this um, posed to the hens. Secondly, uh, we, of course, believe that the farmer knowledge and awareness of welfare is key because um, they interact with the hens on a daily basis. So it's really important that they know of best practices and what they can do to improve welfare on their farms. We've nest, we investigated this through in-person trainings. Um, so beyond that, pre, post, and post-post surveys were also conducted to better understand the gaps initially, and of course, whether such uh, such form of educational intervention can help close these gaps. So some results, um, for instance, when talking about housing systems, it seems that um, the, the training did um, provide some knowledge and awareness and more farmers believe that caged housing systems are bad for, for welfare. And similarly with other issues such as the use of antibiotics, um, hormones, debeaking, declawing, um, we do see that um, more farmers believe that these are bad for, uh, for hen welfare. Another positive uh, output is that um, uh, more than half claimed on-farm improvements, so um, essentially willingness to implement the knowledge that they received, and the majority desire to learn more, uh, showing that there is a, a high need for educational campaigns, um, and it is, you know, regarded as important by by the beneficiaries as well. Finally, we um, assessed on-farm welfare, looking into what 
um, issues occur actually on the farms. I think this is uh, quite important to check across, you know, in theory, what could be wrong. Um, communicating with the farmers on the ground, seeing what struggles they have to upkeep um, welfare. So by visiting farms and collecting data, we looked for prevalent issues, and they typically ranged from, uh, you know, housing issues, flock management in terms of how the personnel interacts with the hens and the overall well-being of hens, including their, their health as well. Um, radiography, so x-rays, were also used to, to quantify the prevalence of uh, kill bone fractures that I mentioned before, the, the issue that's widespread in um, the global north. So after all of this, when we're done, we want to use the impact, tractability, and neglectedness framework to, to suggest some of the you know, most promising interventions that could be feasible. So just to um, start off with the fractures, um, uh, this is a bit of info for those of you who might not be fully familiar with the keel bone issue. So the keel is, is a large bone in, in the hen placed right here. And uh, due to the fact that the hens um, have to or are genetically bred to uh, lay so many eggs nowadays, um, they run the risk of um, their bones getting brittle and weak and um, kind of prone to fractures. So obviously a bone fracture is a very painful experience that we can all attest to. It takes weeks to heal um, and is quite prevalent as it's seen in the global north. But data from the global south is very hard to come by. So that's why it's really important for us to assess the prevalence and severity of this welfare issue. So when looking through um, to like into the x-rays that we, we you know can obtain of this uh, issue, we do see that a healthy bone would be very smooth. There would be no deformation or any cracks visible. Whereas uh, when there is a fracture, we can clearly see it. Typically, we can even tell whether it's a fresh fracture. So being, you know, in the process of healing or whether it's, you know, the callus is already formed and it was a, um, a fracture that has already healed. Um, but as mentioned, um, hens can often even experience several fractures during their lifetime. So it's a, it's a very um, severe issue that we're looking into. But beyond that, we're also exploring other observations on the farms and the issues typically range from suboptimal nest boxes in terms of design or uh, hygiene or the, you know, the, the privacy and shelter that they provide. Uh, stocking density can often be um, too high, preventing the hens from, uh, you know, free movement, expression of natural behavior, and of course, leading to high levels of stress. Uh, there could be no purchase, so the hens can be, experience uh, stress due to not being able to roost at night. Um, similar, some hens can experience thermal stress if there's not enough ventilation as seen here um, and have issues thermal regulating. So there's quite a lot, um, but we're essentially trying to um, see which ones are the most prevalent and perhaps a, a reason for a systemic intervention, the, either educational or otherwise. So kind of to conclude some of the recommendations, uh, feed quality and consistency can be an issue, uh, and that's not only in the global south. So we believe it's an important it's important to keep to make it part of the conversation, especially going forward when cage free has been picking up speed. Uh, targeted welfare training in person can be effective to address some of these awareness and knowledge gaps among farmers, but there is some uncertainty about uh, retention over time, and of course, the actual on-farm effects for the hens. So there needs to be a proper measurement and evaluation in place. And farmers are interested in learning and improving their management. So we believe this brings an opportunity for closer collaboration between animal organizations and them to support them in um, and you know, kind of encouraging them to, to implement those best welfare practices. So with that, I'd like to thank you. And um, yeah, I'm around to answer any of your questions. Do reach out. Thanks. Thank you so much for the wonderful presentation, Lucas. Uh, as y'all may know, I have some rescue chickens. And so this is like very, very interesting to me, uh, but I will defer to the questions in the chat. <laughs> uh, so we have one question from Altamish. Uh, coming from a disability perspective, would studies connecting the disability movement between humans and animals help out? 
That's a great question. Thanks. I mean, it's always helpful to make sure that people can connect better to the issues that hence in this case experience. So of course, raising that kind of empathy response, I believe is always important. So I think it's, it's useful to have these comparisons, right? Where we can relate to the issue when we can imagine the pain that the animal is going through. So I believe it could be very much useful and not only for practitioners, right? But for many, many of the issues that the hands experience. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, we have another one here. There are very few different perspectives on welfare improvements for farmed animals. I'm assuming it's part of your purpose is to increase production costs, but how do you balance that with not putting the producers off talking to you? Sorry, I muted myself and then I couldn't speak anymore. <laughs> Thanks so much. That's a really important question, especially in the global south context, right? Where the socioeconomics are so much more at play. We're seeing that, as you could see from the willingness to learn, right? The farmers want to learn about welfare. They exp express that they care about the hens. They, they understand that they experience pain. So we're definitely seeing that kind of drive for knowledge. But of course, there's so much more press for you know, making a living, let's say. So for instance, when we're seeing macroeconomic changes in the market, um, it's first, unfortunately, the farmers who care about welfare that have to uh, suffer in the end, right? So we, we're seeing caged farms surviving and thriving, whereas the farmers that really try to improve or make a, some sort of improvement are the ones who cannot show sustainability, both um, socially and of course, um, financially as well. So it's an important question and one that we try to address by providing this knowledge and you know uncovering these gaps in knowledge first and then trying to um, trying to see how in the end it could be a sustainable solution that kind of leverages the, the playing field you know so that all the animals experience improvements but of course supports the farmers who are trying to do better at the very least amazing uh got a couple more questions, so hopefully we'll cruise through these. Uh, in the USA, a number of persons have backyard hens for eggs. Can there be a movement or an educational effort to inform them about humane issues? Their cost, uh, and then a uh, comment, their costs of keeping pet hens seems to be high. Mm. Of course, I mean, the costs always go high if you improve the care, right? We, I, I think uh, we can definitely relate to it, right? People who have for instance, rescued hens, they, they know how much it actually takes in terms of time, effort, resources to care for an animal. And, you know, it's, it's quite natural that the costs can be so high that most people wouldn't even consider it. But we do it because we care and we do it because we, we love these friends of ours. So I think um, there's always place for improvement. And at the, back, at the backyard setting, um, there is, of course, opportunity to, to provide that bit, a bit more of that individual care to the animals, you know, because the, the numbers of animals are not as astronomical and, and even hard to comprehend. So I think there is an opportunity to, to improve the conditions and care when, you know, the, the people caring for the hens have that bit of time extra per hen, right? That individual care, that ability to connect and to really understand and learn about the, the individuals that, that we're talking about. So I'm sure there are opportunities and I'm, I'm happy that you're raising these questions and hopefully you can also see how, you know, in your local community or in your, where you are, you can try to approach these because of course, people who care, they can easier relate. Wonderful. And that leaves us time for one more question. Are subs uh, could subsidies be an option or solution for these farmers? And is there a way to do such lobby work locally? Um, great question. Um, and it's, it's one that I cannot directly answer right now because obviously there's so much uh, specifics when we go to each different region. And of course, we, we want to empower the local community, the local animal movement, right? So they know the best. So we definitely don't want to find ourselves in a position where, you know, we're coming with some research and ideas from the global north and we're trying to, you know, improve something. I think it, it has to be through support with ideas that really come from within because there's definitely not a need for external players coming in and trying to fix things. I think 
people on the ground, they know the most what's needed. We're definitely seeing from the farmers that knowledge is needed, continuous sustained support is needed. There's just so much of that intermittent support coming from the north and uh, kind of disappearing after a couple of years. So um, it, it, takes, uh, it, it takes time and effort to, to change something. And I think, yeah, it just depends so much community to community. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm hopeful that we can find these solutions, you know, that are very specific and tailored to, to really uh, be effective. Amazing. Well, thank you again so much, Lucas. That was a very great presentation. Uh, the last speaker in this session is Maria Ruth Carrera, a lecturer and researcher at Lund University, who will present her doctoral research on the European dairy industry. Hi, Maria here. Today I will present part of my PhD dissertation about the discourse of the European dairy industry interest groups. I won't get into the methodology, but you can ask me later, of course. To obtain the production that you see on the screen, European Union farmers keep more than 23 million cows yearly. The average milk yield per cow is 7,000 liters per year. That means that cows now produce six to 10 times more milk than they would naturally for a calf. Dairy activity is problematic in so many ways, animal ethics, the environment, economically. Cows in the dairy industry live only three or four years, suffering all kinds of diseases. They are forcefully impregnated, then have their babies taken away, and once their breast milk produce decreases, they get killed for their meat. This is a map of some of the lobbies related to dairy, represented in the European Lobbies Transparency Register. The dairy industry is pretty serious about promoting its interests. They not only spend more money and time compared to animal advocacy groups, but they also have a complex way of making their case. This involves something called interrepresentation. Basically, a dairy company can have its own lobbies and think tanks with experts who defend and research on their behalf, but it doesn't stop there. These companies can also be part of various other groups, federations, and even have different legal teams representing them. It's like they're making sure their voice is heard from all angles. As activists, some options could be use their same strategies, create specialized think tanks and lobbies or NGOs against specifically this industry and make alliances and be industry specific, make advocacy also at institutional levels. Make sure that the press mediates the knowledge that you gather. People tend to trust information more when they see it in the media compared to hearing it directly from a non-profit group or an activist. The dairy industry depends on public financial support. Knowing this, you can advocate so that plant-based options become the default alternative in public places, such as schools, hospitals, prisons, or universities. In terms of how the industry talks when it comes to the cows, they have all of these discursive strategies. For this part, I found that they do a suppression of the subjects. The industry does an omission of the existence of the cows and their sentience. There is a complete suppression of the subjects' individuality by alienation or the use of metonymy. I will explain later. There is a suppression of the subjects' individuality by doing comparisons with plants. There is a suppression of the subject's autonomy. The industry speaks of the cows as property of someone. There is a repetition of the industry's benefits in relation with animal welfare. The industry actually reacts to the discourses from grassroots movements and say that they care about animal welfare. There is a continuous repetition of the industry's benefits regarding the environment. They, they affirm that its activity is good for the environment and for the rural world. And finally, there's an omission of the calves of the babies and all things maternity. 
I will show you now some examples. First, the metonymy. Metonymy is a way of speaking when something or someone is referred to by a different name, often substituting an effect for a cause or vice versa. In this case, it's like when instead of saying cows, they say dairy cows or dairy animals or food producing animals. They use this language not to address the cows being exploited directly, but to emphasize the purpose of their exploitation. It's a way of focusing on why they are being used rather than acknowledging them as the ones being harmed. Here's another way they make cows seem like objects in the dairy industry talk. They compare getting dairy stuff to getting plants. Keep in mind that when we compare a human to a plant, we are saying that they have no brain activity. Also, in this quote, it begins using the verb to derive, like milk is derived from animals. This word makes it sound like milk comes from animals naturally, almost like it springs out on its own. In terms of how the industry talks when it comes to health and nutrition, they have all of these strategies I, that I will develop now. They do a constant appeal to health, saying that dairy industry products are healthy, even if you are allergic or intolerant to lactose. They have an appeal to science using scientific words, quoting researchers and studies, at the same time omitting that sometimes the quoted ones are studies and scientists on payroll, or that they are scientists, but not the kind that is assumed. There is also a continuous targeting of specific groups as consumers, most of all vulnerable people as kids, elder people, pregnant women. There is a repetition on disqualifications of vegetable substitutes, an anti-vegan narrative that has to do with the race of the plant-based drinks taken off from 2010. There is a repetition of quoting the dietary guides which the industry influences their design first and then later use them for support. There is a constant use of positive communication, euphemisms to avoid negative terms and a common sense narrative. And last, there is uh, the milk tout as uh, white gold or named under glamorous and elitist metaphors like that. Here, the European Dairy Association, EDA, talks about its own discourse in an annual report about their communication strategy. They say that their aim is to construct a dairy protective communication shield against dairy substitutes. Their key communication themes, as you can see, are five, and amongst them are the environment, animal health and welfare, and nutrition and health. Now I will share some ideas. Against their omission of their individuality, Advocates can share a clear message that cows are unique individuals that can feel and experience pain, uh, talk about their friendships, tell real stories like cows hiding their babies to keep them safe or having favorite buddies and also rivals in their groups, talk about their daily routines, talk about their entire nights that they spend calling out for their babies after farmers take them away against them. Uh, the metonymy choose the right words, not the fancy ones the industry uses. For instance, instead of dairy milk, say cows' breast milk, calf's milk, or breast fluid, etc. Instead of dairy cows, say cows used for their breast milk, cows exploited by the dairy industry, etc. Instead of farm animals, you can say farmed animals. Instead of cattle, just say cows exploited by the industry or cows exploited for their fluids. Against their status as property, we should strive to make cows get the person status with the rights that should come from that ideal legal status. Against their complete omission of their dairy secret, dirty secret, sorry, spread the word about how dairy cows are part of the meat industry. They could live up to 20 years, but they are usually sent to be slaughtered at only three, five years old because they are not as productive anymore. Maybe a catchy slogan could be milk is murder and you could appeal to ethical lacto-ovo vegetarians. Talk about and show pictures of cows being mums, just like other mammals. Let people know and show pictures of their pregnancies, 
which um, last for nine months, by the way, speak up and show pictures and sounds of how distressed both the babies and moms get when they are separated. Discuss and show pictures of babies that are thrown away. And this is the what they call the industry's dirty secret. They throw out babies. Share information of, and pictures of cows being forcefully inseminated. Discuss and show pictures of pregnant cows ending up in the slaughterhouses. There is also a lot of basic welfare problems. I'm not saying that you should fight for an improved welfare for their exploitation, but just share the reality that there are a lot of these real problems attached to this industry. Talk about and show that actually cows farmed for dairy suffer more than cows only farmed for meat and end up also being part of the meat industry. You can appeal to the ethical lacto of vegetarians with this info. Dairy cows are part actually of the meat industry. There is plenty of real environmental issues related specifically to the dairy industry. Here you can appeal to the people worried about the climate crisis. And remember two things. One, the dairy industry appeals to different specific target audiences in specific ways. Could be interesting to do the same when doing advocacy against this industry and making specific messages targeting the different segmented publics. Second, drinking cow's milk has been a decreasing trend for years now. However, the consumption of products made with milk, such as for example, cheese or yogurt is growing. Even informed people seem to feel less guilty about consuming these kinds of products. So when you tackle this, it could be interesting to remember these trends. I would like to highlight as conclusions that the analysis shows that the interest groups adapt their narrative to the current values for, of concern for science, environment, health, and even animal welfare while contradicting them to justify their activity. So it's important to show that they are contradicting this narrative and outstanding among the things that they do not talk about what happens to the babies in their industry, which is a very weak point and they are aware of it. That's all, looking forward to your questions for the Q&A, thank you very much. That was incredible, thank you so much. Uh, so we have a question here. Do you see any opportunities for collaboration between animal advocates and environmental advocates to tackle dairy? And if so, how do we go about joining forces? Thank you so much. Yes, definitely, I see absolutely opportunities uh, to tackle this together. Um, how about uh, joining forces? I guess that's the decision to each and every advocate and to each and every group. But uh, absolutely, I can totally see the relevance of joining forces. Amazing. And one more. Uh, what do you think is the highest priority for next steps in research in this area? Hmm. Good question. Um, Good question. Uh, some research has been made lately about, for example, um, how, uh, why vegetarians still uh, have animal products uh, from, from cows, for example. Uh, so I would follow the research along these lines. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. Uh, that concludes our first session of the day. Uh, so for continued discussions on any of these topics, please scroll to the bottom pop-up window that will pop up, um, inviting you, it says, join a breakout room above the dot, dot, dot more. Uh, and you can join the breakout room, Regional Advocacy for Farmed Animals. Uh, the previous speakers will be there. Uh, if you wanted to ask additional questions and didn't get a chance, uh, please go into the breakout room. And the next session, Understanding the Public Perspective, will start at 1.40 Eastern Standard. So you guys have about a little less than 20 minutes to go grab a refreshment and get ready for the next session. Thank you so much.